Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's been a great morning so far. Some of my favorite speakers and um, more to come yet. Um, so what am I talking about today? Well, I picked this slightly uncontroversial title to sort of stir things up a little bit. I don't really totally believe this, but the, there is a beef that I've got today to share with you about how people are doing stuff. Um, just a quick intro slide. Um, those of you who know me know I've been doing this kind of stuff with John Lewis and Love Film and recently, the last 18 months, I've been working for all this kind of bunch of guys optimizing their sites. And for those of you who don't know, hot off the press, um, I'm now looking after product for these guys. They have tempted me away from the land of consulting. It's going to be a great project. Watch this space. So, Bill and Ted. Why have I got Bill and Ted? in a presentation, and I got stuck on this one the other day because a guy said to me, who are Bill and Ted? This is when I realize I'm getting older. Um, so is everybody else, but yeah. The Bill and Ted thing is important because I think a lot of people are playing psychological air guitar, you know? There's all these kind of cool books, and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna like totally introduce scarcity onto our website, and that's gonna rock our conversion rates. And I see a lot of people doing air guitar with this stuff. You know, they're burning rubber, like doing donuts in a car park. Lots of smoke, lots of noise. Not actually going anywhere or changing anything. Still, it's kind of fun for you. Um, and the best example of this that I could bring up, really, was I was sitting in a presentation. There were some guys next to me, and they'd watch somebody presenting this video, The Invisible Gorilla. And if you haven't watched it, don't bother, OK? <laughs> not going to teach you anything. And the guy said to his colleague, he said, great, this is an interesting video. He said, what the fuck do I do with that then? Dress the CEO up in a gorilla suit and put a YouTube video on the homepage? Obviously not, but it's my beef about the whole practical application of this sort of stuff. And there are some great books and new learnings about the brain, but you know, you can read this stuff as a bit like behavioral economics porn. It's interesting to read, but you're never going to get the chance to do stuff like that in real life. And I'm going to help you try and bridge that little gap with a practical toolkit for getting inside people's heads. So today I'm going to be running through these kind of things. And please come and grab me afterwards if you've got any questions. But these are the kind of tools that I'm using to get inside people's heads so that I can actually then create levers that I can turn into experiments on my client sites. So this stuff is important. This is about the doing of it, not just the reading of it. Coffee table book. First big tip is stop listening to those time-wasting morons that you called colleagues. They really know nothing at all. They're just guessing like you. Like you, they're just too scared to admit that they're all kind of guessing. So you're all scared to admit to each other, you're guessing, get outside to the office. This is one of the most powerful techniques for getting inside customers' heads. When I sit in a workshop and I ask people, when's the last time you actually talked to a customer, read their emails, asked them questions? And when you go around the whole table and they say things like, never, you sort of think, yeah, you're doing the marketing for this $1 billion company internationally, and you've never spoken to a, a single customer or looked at anything by customers since you joined this place. You're doomed. Um, get out of the office. Um, the, the, the big traditional one for a lot of people is, is lab testing. And this is a great photo because this is actually a stock photo where they've put somebody in the picture who actually bothered to fucking come to the test. This doesn't happen in real life. It's actually empty chairs. That's you hoping that your colleagues will turn up and watch the usability test. So normally I would get one or two people along to these tests if I was really lucky or I bribed them with cake and biscuits and things. Um, but there is a solution to this. Remote UX testing. You can set up a machine in London and then you can remote control and share it with a, a product called join.me. And the person who's actually running the test can be in Florida. Amazing, right? But then all your colleagues who are scattered around the globe can actually dial into any one of these usability sessions as they fit it in with their day's work. They don't have to make a special trip. They can actually dial in, watch one hour session, and then maybe see another one at the end of the day. So how many people do I normally get for these type of tests? Well, it's about 15 to 20 people show up. So you've now got 15 times the internal PR for your efforts to mind customers' heads and spread that knowledge widely within your company. So try and do more remote tests. 
There's also the whole point of you've got a website, right? Traffic comes to it. So you can actually use people, crowd of people that come to your site, and you can ask them to perform usability tests, look at prototypes or mock-ups that you've made, and give you feedback on designs. You know, there's no point in asking the CMO if he's just fucking guessing like everybody else. Ask real people who will be, uh, uh, you know, responsible for the performance of your product what they actually think about it. And these tools um, are, are all great and will give you access very cheaply to feedback from consumers. And they will tell you things that you can then turn into psychological levers and play back to them. And nowadays, you know, people used to have their computers always at home. But look, these guys have got all their computers with them. And they also have another computer that they carry around everywhere in the shape of their mobile phone. So you can go to the context where people are hanging out. If you make a travel app, you can go to a railway station. But it's a great way, look, you can take your colleagues out and basically go for beer or coffee. For the price of a beer or coffee, you can actually get somebody to give you some useful insight into your site, your product, your app, your mobile site in a friendly context like this. So getting out of the office with your latest prototype and showing it to people is going to be far better than asking your colleagues what they think. You need to get out of the office more. If you want to do recording when you're out of the office, these are the tools you want to look at. These are either free or very, very cheap, and they will allow you to record people. These are pretty interesting because this one, UX Recorder, will allow you to get somebody to browse the website on a mobile phone and it will take a recording of it so you can replay it later. And this one called Reflector is pretty cool because you can have somebody in one room sort of sitting on a sofa with their tablet and you can mirror the screen to another room and actually record the whole session. Big benefit of that is they can sit kind of naturally like they do at home. So that's a, a really clever way of actually getting recordings of people. Um, Last but not least, don't assume that if you're going to go out and start talking to people out there, that you know the right questions to ask, or the right way to sort of calm people down, or the way to chisel the information that you really need out of their brains. This thing that's attached to the front of the face that sort of moves up and down, it lies. And the skill of any usability testing, or indeed any customer interviewing, isn't how you do it. These two books at the top have all the tools that you need to go and ask people questions. And these five articles at the bottom um, will give you all the tips you need to actually run effective interviewing yourselves. So don't ignore this. Don't think you can just go and ask some random questions because you will be biased, right? And it's that bias that you have to manage out in the way that you're interviewing people. And here is one of the most powerful techniques, and this is one that um, I've just kicked off at the moment. But how do you actually work out how people use your service on multiple platforms, mobile, desktop, app, and how do you measure them as they move through time and space? How, wouldn't it be great if you could actually follow your customers it, through their entire journey in a multi-device, multi-channel, multi-platform, multi-everything world, and you were actually able to find out what they were doing not just when they visit your mobile site, but how it all glues together as a chain of events. And the best example of this you'll see in this article, which is about diary studies. You get people to keep a diary. Every time they, they go shopping for clothes, you get them to keep a diary. Every time, in this case, these guys are, are playing music. So every time they play music, they should send you a photo of where they're playing music, what they're doing, what they're listening to, what speakers they have where they're at at the time they're listening to the music. These type of multi-device diary studies will give you far better insight than your analytics or something that somebody has dreamed up within your organization. This is top of my list for cool things that you can do this year. Another really important point is to immerse yourself in stuff. There's not enough of this. You know, it's called eating your own dog food or walking the walk. You know, I meet a lot of marketing people who've never actually gone to Google, searched, clicked on their PPC ad or their display ad, looked at the landing page, ordered the stuff, went all the way through. You know, you should actually be trying this stuff out. Um, there's a company called Conversion Rate Experts, and they did a bit of work for a flat pack shed company. And so they ordered the shed to their house. 
And you know that pointy bit at the front of the shed that looks like that? That meant that it wouldn't fit through the doors in the house. And these guys are in a terraced house, so how are they gonna get the shed piece over the back? They had to saw it in half, right? So that company's now changed the way that they build their products because somebody actually bothered to use their own shit. It's really important. Um, some senior marketing guys, I asked, I said, does it really annoy you when you call up the phone number on someone's website and it says, please visit our website at www.blahblahblah.com? And you think, no, I just came from there, you bastard. Um, and they all put their hands up. And then I said, please put your hand down if you know that your company doesn't have this bullshit message on your own phone line. And they didn't know. This is the problem. It annoys the hell out of you, but that doesn't mean you know if you're doing this painful thing to your customers or not. So try and actually experience things. Buy the product, send the shoes back, be difficult, call the phone numbers. If you haven't walked in the feet of uh, the customer, the magical slippers of customer experience will take you to some really interesting places. Um, and, you know, your whole team really should be mystery shoppers here. But just be careful, you're not the customer. You're not actually substituting for a usability test here. What you're trying to figure out is just to try and develop a little bit of empathy for what they're going through. A really important thing here, if you don't have this installed on your site, it's the missing link between qualitative and quantitative data. So quantitative in terms of your analytics or other data that you've collected, and qualitative in terms of usability testing. If I want to figure out if my postcode finder box is working for hundreds of people, a usability, with eight people is, a usability test with eight people isn't going to cut it, because I'm only going to test eight postcodes. I actually want to see data at volume of people using a product, then I use a session replay tool. And this is just like having a video recorder that shows what people type in, where they move their mouse, what they click on. And if you set this stuff up right, you can actually infer a lot of kind of behavior and psychology and what's going through people's minds just from actually looking at these recordings. So don't ignore this. This is uh, an excellent tip for getting some stuff that you won't get from any other tools. And these are the three best ones at the moment. Clicktail is good, but kind of hard to get set up right, but brilliant reporting. Session cam and inspectlet. Really quick and easy to get set up, not as good as reporting as Clicktail. Anyway, try them. Number four, voice of customer. Having site-wide kind of omnipresent feedback in your emails all, all over everywhere, or it's kind of triggered behavioral feedback. You know, if you bail from something, you, you don't finish a process off. This is a really good way of asking people. If someone comes in, people keep coming into your furniture shop and then walking out, I mean, are you just going to sit there and let them, or are you going to ask the people leaving, was it something we did, or are you looking for something? It's called asking people stuff and inviting feedback, negative or not. Um, the one that a lot of conversion optimizers use is this one called Qualaroo, but actually they've changed their model, and um, I'm getting a lot of good positive things about Feedback Daddy, which is basically a lot cheaper. Um, please, please never underrate surveys. If you're not doing regular surveys and asking people, you're not building up a knowledge bank of information over time with your product. And that's a really critical thing. And if you want to know how to design really good surveys, then these are the, these are the people you need to read, right, or talk to or do stuff with. It's Luke Robluski, Caroline Jarrett, and Sticky Content. And there's the two books there um, that are involved. But with... By reading these books and getting a lot of help from sticky content in terms of training and stuff, we got a 35% click-through rate on an NPS email that goes out to people and a 94% fill-out rate. I mean, I'm never going to get a 6% drop rate on a funnel ever, ever again. It's just not going to happen. Um, but this is a really good example of the kind of stuff you can get if you actually put the effort in and read the stuff. And interestingly enough, Belron actually has a higher NPS score than Apple in a lot of Western European markets, okay? So you've got nice, white, expensive, sexy consumer product, and then you've got distressed purchase, broken windscreen. How can you possibly make a broken windscreen scenario outperform 
the sexiness and brilliant buying experience of getting an Apple product. Well, the reason is, is that they have this systematic program where they, they look at all of this stuff, they analyze it, and then they try and wash out the problems. And it's that continuous improvement cycle, whether you're working in a Nissan factory or Sunderland, or you're working in an Autoglass branch, you're practicing continuous improvement. And they figure out what's driving delight and dissatisfaction, they optimize, and then they repeat. And that's why they've got that kind of score. So making contact and feedback really easy and simple everywhere, even adding it to emails, is really important. But getting rating on the service metrics, like, don't just ask people for a high level kind of customer satisfaction score. Ask them about the bits of the service. Was the support good? Was the return service good if you used it? And those service metrics will actually tell you where to spend your money to get a higher satisfaction score. So if we're gonna spend five million here or five million there, this one will actually make the satisfaction score go higher. It's a thing called regression if you're interested. But the whole point about this is, is it tells you where to spend your money. You don't have infinite money to spend to keep customers delighted. You need to know where it's gonna get the best return on investment. But another really important point here is Take your team or uh, individual team members of the whole group for a half day a month at the call center or whoever's doing your support. And don't have a meeting with them with the boss there. Take them out and get them fucking hammered, right? And then ask them without the boss around, what is wrong? What really grinds their gears about your website? What really pisses off the customers? And they will tell you the truth. Don't look at the lovely KPI, fluffy KPI insulation reports that the call center puts out. Take them for beers and get them bitching. That's what you need to do. And acting like a private eye here is pretty good. I love sniffing out stuff on what people are up to. It's got a practical point of view. No point in you doing a 50% off sale in the same week that your competitor's launching their 75% off sale, is there? So how could you solve that? Well, you can monitor their site, sign up for their newsletters, get, get Google alerts on the case. Um, you can even see what conversion tools they're using and there are tools that will monitor when your competitors launch split tests. You know, it won't tell you which one won, but at least you know that they're testing some stuff. It should be interesting. And when I was at Love Film, one of the things that really helped us crush the competition and get a dominant position in the market was running um, those kind of NPS and service metric surveys across our competitors as well. So we knew where we could outspend them and beat them without them being able to catch up to us. And, and, and that, that, was, that was a killer app for that kind of survey tool. Um, if you want to find out what people are up to, I'm not going to go into all the details. There's one slide deck here, which is the stone cold best slide deck on this sleuthing stuff. And there's a great article from Kiss metrics on James Bond type stuff that you can do on the internet. Very, very good. The title of this is very interesting because I had a client who was losing eight million pounds a year because they had a browser bug on their site. Internet Explorer 8 was converting at a quarter of the rate that it normally does because of this bug. And they just said, we, we like never noticed it. Wouldn't, wouldn't they call us up and tell us if it was broken? after a few minutes laughing and then picking myself up off the floor, I said, no, they will not call you. What you need to do is test the shit that people are using on your website, you know, the devices. You should be looking at how your emails render. Great if you spent all that time sending out all those mail shots, but not so great if people can't actually read it on their mobile device. You've just wasted marketing time and effort. You're burning rubber again. Same is true for browser testing. If you're not actually checking your A-B tests or seeing that people can actually use the browsers that they have on your site, then you're making a big mistake. You could be losing money. It would be like if buggies couldn't actually get into John Lewis, the store manager would kind of notice and say, we have to make the doors wider. But if this stuff is happening in your site and you aren't checking it, no one's going to call you up. You're just going to lose money. So. Uh, and last but not least, test on real devices. Deviceanywhere.com will allow you to rent a mobile phone in Iraq, anywhere around the world, 
and remote control it like it was there at your desk. So there's no excuse not to test with what customers actually hold in their hands or use to come to your site because it's costing you fucking money. This is a well-known brand and they didn't know that they were, um, this money was being sucked out of their account every year. Another important one, you probably know some of these split testing tools. I'm not going to talk about them, but I'm going to talk about the future of split testing, which is very interesting from the psychology angle, because in the future I'll be able to test more stuff. At the moment, I might test lots of things on a website, and I'll analyze the data, but I won't know why one version won over the other. Did people prefer the fluffy kitten over the cute puppy because it was their age or their gender? or the landing page that they came from, or the keyword that they typed into Google. I can go and look at this stuff, but what happens if I get an algorithm to tell me what the drivers are of why they chose this creative in the test? And that's why these, tools at the bottom, these two tools at the bottom, Conductors and Reco, are very interesting, and a lot of the big vendors of testing software are also exploring this area. And all you do is you chuck loads of things into the hopper, and it works out what the best stuff to show people at what time is. It will learn that a picture of a female person on the website will work better at weekends. So it can replay that for you. But it can also tell you why some of these tests are winning and what the underlying visitor attributes are that are actually driving that response rate that you see. This is a new and exciting future. It doesn't put me out of a job. It just means that I can do far more than I used to be able to do. But an interesting little bit about hypothesis design, and this is the crux of things for me, this is where people get it wrong, right? Because if we admit that we're all guessing and we're in guessaholics anonymous and we have to surrender to the higher power of the customer, kind of where does it go horrendously wrong for people? It's because they have all these kind of crap inputs, you know, panic, ego, opinion, something somebody else did, a knee-jerk reaction. This is all wrong stuff. You need to be able to replace the inputs that you have to designing tests and experiments that you're going to do on consumer psychology with this kind of stuff. I have no clicker. Do I have a clicker? Yes, I do. So first of all, this, this is a bunch of us doing this kind of stuff, um, uh, brainstorming and creating a hypothesis up in Manchester for some guys that I know called PRWD. And, you know, first of all, assemble a really wide team and get the right inputs on the table in front of everybody and kind of share that data and research. And also, if you can, design some emotive writing guidelines. These are the ones from Autoglass. This is the landscape of consumer psychology that allows us to put crowbars into the user experience and lever for all they're worth. So this stuff is basically a guide to how can, these are the things that are in their heads that they're kind of worried about. Their worries, their fears, their barriers to transacting with us. If we can answer these or deal with these during the process, then it will actually give us a big lift in our tests. So this is great to have this sort of stuff. Develop it yourself, and any good UX researcher will be able to help you come up with this. But it g gives you a driver for your copywriting. This is from a film called The Omen. And the problem is, is that in this country... People are actually scared when they get damage to their glass. They think the fucking windscreen is going to fall into their laps in the car. It's not going to happen. They think either the windscreen is going to fly off as they're driving, or it's going to fall into the car and cut someone's head off, right? It's not actually going to happen. It's just an irrational fear. But when I explored copy to exploit this, hey, sneaky, keep your family safe and get back on the road with Autoglass. The response to this was amazing because it totally worked. Because it basically said, if you don't get that chip or crack fixed, then your family is going to die, <laughs> right? And I was thinking, part of me was thinking, yes, this is great. And another part of me thought, no, I can't use this. We decided not to use this in the end. This is the wrong side of the ethical line for us. But it shows you how powerful exploring these things with customers gives you these levers. Don't just come up with them in your head. So sit down with the rest of your colleagues and then ask these questions about the page or process that you're designing. I'm not going to explain all of them. They're prompt questions. They'll get the juices flowing. Have a look at your copywriting guidelines. 
have a pack of these on the table, get mental notes, they're like card prompts for psychological techniques that you can use, and then think, well, what, which ones of these can we can use in this situation? But essentially, all of the work that's happening here at that table, that picture earlier on, is this. We believe that doing A for people B will make outcome C happen, and we'll kind of know this when we get this data and feedback back. That's where all my work goes around. And then what we did here in this particular scenario is we all then looked at that stuff and then came up with our own sketches and then went round the team and shared the sketches and then that led to a few more rounds of brainstorming and we came up with our hypothesis. So that's what it all hinges on. Um, almost last point. Hire or train great copywriters. And, you know, this is one area that people underinvest in uh, on the web. And, you know, David Ogilvy kind of sums it up here. Um, my quote on this is that it wasn't pictures or design. It was actually words that have gotten the lifts in my split test. So about 60, 70 odd percent of the lifts that I got from any split test were from playing with the words. It wasn't with anything else. So the words are the most powerful part of this because of the emotional side. You know, every word, every error message, every piece of copy, uh, the emails, the forms, the web pages are your brand and experience from the consumer's point of view. If they've just rocked up at your website, the words that you use set the emotional lens through which the entire product is viewed. And I've split tested people with shitey error messages and friendly error messages, and their review of the product at the end, which is essentially the same, is totally different. So. You know, one tip, please don't get developers to write error messages. They have all the empathy of a riled cockroach, you know. Um, the, you, you really don't want that. Don't make it their job to write the error messages. Make it a copywriter or psychologist's job to write the error messages because they really make a big difference. And uh, there's a great article from Brian here, which you should read, which shows you how to control the eye flow in a page by the way you write and design the copy. A good example here of just copy. These guys tried 100% privacy, we will never spam you, and it totally depressed the signups. What happens there? It's because you're reminding them about spam, right? They didn't want to be reminded about spam. And they changed it to this. We guarantee 100% privacy. Great, your information, that, well, that's 20% higher. So just changing that one sentence makes a massive difference to the growth potential of your company. It would be like if you were shopping and they had a sign up that says, we promise never to maim or kill you while shopping. <laughs> and you're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, so a really important one. Click. Where's the clicker gone? The clicker's not working again. Yes. I'm not going to go through these. There are no behavioral economics books in these slides. Why? Because there aren't any that are practically useful for me in building tests. All these books and resources here are stuff that will actually help you run real experiments with real people and get real insights. So please soak it all up. Um, a little word for Agile. If you do not have a fast process for doing these kind of tests and getting loads of experiments out, and having an agile environment is really a prerequisite to that, then you will fail because you'll get only three or four things done a year. You know, I, I know some clients that I've been working with who are now doing 10 or 12 tests a month, right? And they still don't think that's enough. Now, if you're doing like two or three a year, then someone's going to eat your lunch. And really all the work that I'm doing is kind of a combination of these three techniques, you know. So it's involving data and users. And it's users, their context, your product, and the data, and those things combined are where the action is at for me. And, and for optimizing your stuff, you really need to think like a department store owner. You're not going to get an unlimited budget to fix all of your website or optimize it every year, and neither will a department store owner, John Lewis in Oxford Street, get the budget to refurb the entire store every year. You've got to pick your opportunity. Where there's footfall, where it's underperforming, and where there's clearly an opportunity, you invest your money there, and the same should be true of your website. And like was mentioned earlier, learn from failure, learn from the dark side. Actually go out and find pissed off customers and talk to your complaints teams because the psychological insights that you get from there will help you design things to reduce your churn. And you, you might have a high acquisition cost, but you could also be losing the business out of the other end. Using great photos is really important. 
And if you're going to use any photography on your site, then buy this book. It costs three euros. Please get it. One little example here on uh, photography. Can anyone tell me why, and this test was exactly the same basically, I assume it's exactly the same, why did this lady here not do as well as this German lady? Any, any ideas? Let me show it again. You've seen that one everywhere. Why? Because she's a stock photo. That's right. Stock photos don't work. That's why, and this is one that we slipped in to try it out. That's why no autoglass adverts around the world or any promotional materials feature anything other than employees. There's a reason for it. Um, if you really like these kind of photos, please visit this site. It's not a porn site. It's called headsethotties.com. Um, there are other stock... <laughs> stock memes that you can check out here. Um, and a perfect example I get told by the Spanish marketing director, this woman was ugly. She's ugly, you know? And, and, you know, they had better photos of ripped guys carrying tires and pieces of glass around looking like Rafa Nadal. And they thought that they would win. They're the most beautiful people, right? They should win. And she slayed them all. She beat all the guys in that test. And that's the important point. It's not about what you think. It's about the reaction it causes in the mind of the viewer that you are designing for. And that's the important thing. I've put a list in here of the attributes of what I think the best companies are actually doing. And if you read through that later on, I think you find, you know, figure out which stuff you are doing and what you aren't doing. If you want to be successful and run lots of kind of psychological experiments on your website, you need to have some of these attributes, as many as possible. And last but not least, an example of a business future testing. This is from Get Revising, who are part of the student room group. And they said to me, well, yeah, well, we're kind of thinking maybe we're giving away too much in our free product, but we don't really want to redesign it and recode the whole site. Is there any way we can find out what it might be like? And so we split tested it by, by actually removing features on this table and showing people more and more Xs to find out, could we keep the free signups pretty much the same, but could we increase the paid signups? And by selectively removing these features, we actually find out we could increase the paid signups by 185%, with the free ones relatively unaffected. And you can also put this kind of message at the end. So you've lied to them and tricked them by showing them an experiment, but then you just say to them at the end, hey, do you know what? You're really lucky today. We're going to give you everything for free. So this company was able to model their business future without doing a single line of coding, okay? No spend. So guess what they're doing now? They're now embracing that model. Um, there's some amazing stuff about the brain. You'll be learning a, a lot about it today, but it's really all about the inputs and the execution. And I think there's a lot of resources in here. If you read this stuff, if you study it, you'll do much better than your competitors at these kind of testing. Uh, te techniques. And really, there's so much evidence that this stuff works that if it's not working for you, you're just not doing it right. And the air guitar thing. So at John Lewis, we had this album on sale and somebody decided to put some crappy neuromarketing text as a flash on the side. Can anyone guess what the crappy neuromarketing text was that they put on here? A free air guitar with every copy, right? Brilliant. That'll totally rock, won't it? One problem. All the fuckers who came up and asked for their free air guitar, right? <laughs> I am not kidding you. The people say, where's my free air guitar? And they were like, there is no free air guitar. And then they started doing this and going like that. And they were totally confused. But the best one was a guy who had a ringtone on his phone. They would ask for the air guitar. He would put the ringtone on, and then he would go like that, play the guitar, and then hand it over. In the end, John Lewis got them to take this crap off because it was driving them crazy. Please don't do air guitar psychology is my final message. Thank you for your time. <laughs>